Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome back. In the last class, we were discussing the speculative philosophy as we found it in classical Greece. We found considerable foundations of scientific thought laid out in that period leading to what we might call modernity these days. Now, from there to the modern, we are talking of in time chronologically a movement from around the 5th century BC to something like 16th century AD. We are talking about 2100 years. This 2100 years is a period during which very little seemed to have happened by way of scientific speculative thinking. There was a lot of theology as Christianity set up roots constituted itself into church and later churches. There was a lot of theology. There was a lot of mystical thinking too among certain monastic orders in Christianity, but there was very little flowering of scientific thinking as you found in the times of Pythagoras and a hundred years or so after him. So, we shall walk through this 1600 years or 2000 years actually, we shall walk through this 2000 year period in today's sessions and let us lead ourselves on to modernity. What happened to Greece? towards the end of the 5th century and then afterwards B C. We know that the period from around 550 to around 410 B C was a truly productive golden period, not only in Greece of that time, but also in the very history of Europe. We saw bits and pieces of this as far as we could in terms of mystical philosophical thinking and speculative philosophical thinking too in the last couple of classes. But all of this ends in the 3rd century BC dramatically and then comes a big interregnum from around 3rd century BC to about 5th century AD. And after that, from the 6th century AD, the whole of Europe seems to go into a period of big darkness. It is called the dark age till about the 13th century AD. So, the questions we shall be asking today and trying to answer are what happened to Greece towards the closing 50 years of the 5th century BC and then what happened to Greece afterwards till finally there is very little of Greece left enveloped totally 
in what came to be known as the Roman Empire. And then subsequently, even the Roman Empire by the 6th century becomes a Christian Empire. So, the western world becomes a world of Christianity by then from then on. If we want to know what happened in Greece in the second half of the 5th century BC, we have to start earlier on. We had two great wars. between 490 and 470 BC with the Persians. Darius, Xerxes, two great Persian emperors defeated by a federation of Greek cities under the leadership of Athens. By the time it is 470 BC, the Persian incursion and the threats it imposed are becoming memory. From there on becomes a great period in the history of Greece again led by Athens. You see what happens is this federation of cities against the Persians is kind of constituted under duress of war, under duress and the threat of being extinguished. The Greek cities had to come together to fight the Persians and Athens does a tremendous job trying to bring these cities together. In the process gradually Athens assumes leadership of Greece and becomes virtually the political headquarters of Greece. Much to the resentment of other cities especially Sparta with which Athens has a running dispute. Not just because Sparta is an independent city on its own, very proud, very militant, very aggressive. But the fact also remains that the cultures of Athens and Sparta are diametrically different. So, from around 14, from around 450 BC onwards, begins increasing conflicts between Sparta and Athens. Increasingly for about 30 years increasingly costly to both the economies and to Greece as a whole till finally a huge epidemic of plague what wipes out most of Athens population and along with it the great ruler of Athens and that is virtually the end of Athens because Athens loses out to Sparta in the war. And from there on the Greek civilization starts declining. You see the victory of Sparta is a victory of what might be called the more boorish section of Greek population. Athens was the home of culture, Sparta was not. But Spartans were great fighters and far more conservative than Athenians used to be. Whatever with the rise of with, with the conquest of Athens by Sparta begins the decline of the Greek civilization. And the next century is the century of the Macedonians. Who are the Macedonians? Sharanya. Hmm? Take a shot. Um, from Macedonia, but other than that I am not sure. Okay. Can you? Can you? Alexander and his father. Oh my God, that's tremendous. They are Macedonians, but there were many other Macedonians too. But still, that's right. The Macedonian, the word Macedonian brings into mind Philip and Alexander. It is said that Alexander engineered the death of Philip, Philip but we do not 
think of it now because they are all Macedonians. Right, Alexander, quite an extraordinary phenomenon of all times in human history, young, leading his troops across the world, comes right up to Punjab and then sets up his branches from Punjab through um, Tigris and Euphrates, Euphrates valleys and all the way up Syria on to Egypt and you name it, he has the world in his palm. So, the Macedonian empire peaks off the second epoch in the history of the Greeks. The first epoch of course, is the epoch when they are all classical. We are not talking of the pre-classical Greeks here, it is all beginning there. The second epoch is the conquest by Macedonians, when there is subservience and no peace for the Greeks. In the classical epoch, there was no subservience, they were free and they had no peace for themselves, because they fought each other all the time. And around approximately 211 BC, I think, the Romans conquer Egypt and that heralds the end of Macedonian empire. Where did Rome come from? Suddenly, out of the blue. Well, you see, Rome was another city, republic as it were, as all the Greek cities used to be. If you, if you recall, we have talked about Greek cities in Ionia in the northern side, then in the mainland Greece and then the islands of Greece, around Greece and most importantly in southern Italy. And we have also said the cities, Greek cities of southern Italy and the islands were usually homes where a lot of mysticism, orphism, that sort of thing grew faith, religion, that approach to the universal. Whereas, the Ionians were people who brought in a lot of thinking, brought in a lot of philosophy, bring, who brought in a lot of, you know, scientific outlook, who were the ones who brought a lot of knowledge from Babylonia and Egypt, on to Egypt, I am sorry, on to Greece. Now, in the period when Roman annexation takes over the third period of the Greek history, you had complete conquest of Greeks, no political independence, total subservience and no peace. In other words, it is an extension of the Macedonian rule, but on a permanent basis, because by this time the remnants of the great Greek civilization are vanishing. Now, the Roman empire as I said grew out of the growth of the city state of Rome, gradually into eminence and leadership as Athens had in the 5th century. By about the end of the 3rd century, the Romans had conquered all of North Africa. Syria and all the way down up to Babylonia, the estuaries of Tigris and Euphrates. They had conquered all of France as it is known today. They had conquered a large part of Great Britain. So, the Roman Empire extended all the way from the Danube in the east in Europe to the Thames in London and then it extended all the way from the coasts of the Baltic Sea in the north, all the way down to the valleys of Tigris and Euphrates, deep down in the Arabic world or rather in the, in the Middle Eastern world, Arabic world came later. Roman Empire too had its nemesis and this nemesis was largely its own growth. See, at its peak, 
the political leadership in Rome had created provincial government across the empire which had considerable autonomy, which had considerable sets of obligations and rights vis-a-vis -vis Rome, an excellent system of law and an outstanding army and more importantly a tremendous capacity for public works, road making, bridges all of which were responsible for the rapid movement of the Roman army and the legionaries across Europe. It is this expansion which gradually led to the demise. On the one hand, as more and more wars were fought, the cost of fighting more and more wars had to be distributed more and more across the provinces. So, the provinces had to bear the fiscal burden of the war increasingly. At one point, the burden of the war became so intense that prefects of townships where the Romans ruled used to flee because the penalty for not collecting enough taxes and paying it to Rome was severe. So, the law was made that prefects should not run away, they should stay in the townships. So, gradually the magnificent orderliness of Roman legal system, political and bureaucratic system became more and more and more repressive. About this time, the army suddenly realizes that it is the most powerful institution in the whole of Roman Empire. So, army takes it into its head that it should become the king maker of the Romans. So, army takes its privilege to assassinate a Caesar or it may throw somebody out and put somebody else in his place. In other words, the army becomes central in deciding political leadership in Roman Empire and the price is heavy for that because what happens is different factions of the army start supporting different leading political numeraries in Rome and the price expected is not only rewards as salary by the soldiers, but also bonuses in the form of trophy after the victory is won against the other Roman whom you are fighting and finally land grants. The victorious soldiers who fought for the winning person who became the king of Rome or the ruler of Romans demanded and acquired grants of land. So, a new breed of aristocracy was growing in Roman Empire and this is a very destructive process because what one general could do with his troops another general could, what one aspiring politician could do another could. So, the resources for these came from agriculture from the whatever manufacture that existed in short from economic activities. More and more of resources were taxed away from productive economic activity onto the wastefulness of war and or more importantly on to the incredible corruption that grew out of it of some kind of warlordship which the generals and the troops had. So, this goes on for quite a while till about 2, 300 years till about 250 years I think after Christ when a Caesar called Augustus comes into power and there is a period of great peace after which of course, things start deteriorating slowly. But by this time as this deterioration occurs, there is yet another force which is operating in Europe which has started operating actually around uh, 150 years after Christ which is the hordes from the east called the Huns, they are pressing in on eastern Europe. 
they are coming in waves and pressing in on Eastern Europe. And who is in Eastern Europe? People known as the barbarian tribes, the Vandals, the Goths, the Ostrogoths, the Visigoths, the Franks. These people are under pressure from the East and they start moving in onto the Roman Empire, exerting their pressure. So, eventually the Roman Empire comes under threat from the raiding arms of various groups of so called barbarians. By this time too, the great empire is split into two, the eastern and western empire. The western empire located in Rome and the eastern empire located in Byzantium, which today is known as Istanbul, but in those days became known as Constantinople after the great emperor Constantine. who was a great eastern empire leader. It is the eastern empire which becomes officially Christian first. King Constantine makes Christianity the official religion of the Roman state, at least of the eastern wing and the reason is very clear. One, a miracle is promised to him in a war and if the miracle happens, he should get into the Christian faith. It is said that the miracle happened and Constantine became a Christian, but most important, more than two thirds of the army of Constantine were already Christians. So, in order to be a popular leader, he had to make the nation a Christian nation. So, by the time of Constantine, Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire. As I said originally in the eastern half and later on in the western half in Rome. While that is the case, the fact that Rome was a kind of a cultural headquarters of the Christians became evident long before because both St. Paul and St. Peter had, uh, had attained their martyrdom in Rome and therefore, Rome was sanctified and at least 300 years of repression and harassment of Christians happened in Rome. You have heard of the catacombs of Rome where large number of Christian believers used to hide from persecution and the persecution as we have seen earlier was quite intensive. So, eventually when the leadership of Christian religious group happened to find a center, it was naturally Rome and it became the headquarters of the Christian world ruled by the Christian ruler called Pope the Pope became the head, the ecclesiastic head of Europe by that time. Well then the Vandals, the Goths, the Visigoths, the Ostrogoths, they attack and raid the Roman emperor, Empire by 14, I think the year 461 if I am not mistaken is the year when at last the Goths sacked the city of Rome. With that, the victory of the barbarians is more or less taken for granted. Does this mean that the Roman empire became a barbarian empire or does it became, does it mean barbarians replaced Rome forever? No, it is a trade off. For nearly 100, 150 years, you know the Goths and Ostrogoths and Franks and people are you know pressing in on the Roman Empire and making inroads, taking territory and most important in the process becoming Christians. 
So, eventually the political victory of the Goths in the sack of Rome and eventually the victory of the Lombards in the capture of the cities in the north of the Italian peninsula. All this is merely institutionalization of a new era in that part of the world. What is happening in this new era is that the erstwhile barbarian has become politically supreme, militarily supreme, at least in the western part of the Roman Empire. The eastern part is still holding on with Constantinople as its headquarters, but the western part is seem seemingly taken over by the barbarians. So, yes, they have taken over politically, they have taken over militarily. But the barbarians were endlessly envious of the Romans for their culture, their laws, their rules, regulations, their political organization. So, over a period of time, you find the barbarian rulers trying to become more Roman than Romans. So, this is what is happening here by the 4th or 5th century. Christianity has come to hold itself strong. in both eastern and western empires. In both eastern and western empires, it is the official religion. Not only that, it is the religion of all the conquerors of Rome, the barbarians. So, by the fifth century, you can say Christian Europe comes into existence in a full fledged form. Do you have any questions at this point? Okay, you do not have questions, I will ask you a question. Have you heard of Saint Ambrose? Have you heard of Saint Augustine? Tell me about Saint Augustine. Aditi. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, um, the, um, if you look at Western philosophy, uh, uh, Greek, uh, the classification of Greek philosophy, the uh, medieval philosophy is associated with Saint, Saint Augustine and the, uh, some of the more Christian based religions. Very true. Very true. Very true. And what did you have to say? Much later, Thomas. No, no, no. Saint Augustine was pre scholastic. And Saint, uh, Saint, Ac Saint Thomas Aquinas was kind of end of scholastics. Between them is almost a period of 900 years. Saint Augustine spelt the end of one era of Christianity, where it is known as the, the four great doctors of Christianity came into existence. Saint Jerome, Saint Augustine, Saint Ambrose and then Pope Gregory the Great. Their preoccupations are entirely theological. You do not have the Greek type of philosophical speculation, which is already rejected and thrown out as pagan philosophy. What has to be taken from the pagans has been taken from Plato. By the time people like Saint Augustine are writing, a little bit of substantial bit of Plato is absorbed into Christian theology. More importantly, the idea of the martyrdom of the religious leader, which you find in the Orphism cult. This becomes translated into the martyrdom of Jesus Christ in Christianity. There is a continuum of belief systems out there, which ends up with the martyrdom of Jesus Christ. But other than all these things, Saint Jerome, Saint Augustine, Saint Ambrose, these are great figures in the history of the church, probably very great figures at that time in the western world. Their work was entirely theological. There was no scientific work. In fact, all knowledge by that time 
became the monopoly of the ecclesiastical institutions, church and its organizations. And all non ecclesiastic learning was discouraged, including St. Ambrose was very strongly against non ecclesiastic learning. In other words, learning should be done by church and only through the church. So, already the ground was set for a long period of hibernation in faith. So, from the 6th century begins a long period in philosophic terms till the 16th century or at least the 15th century, when Europe seems to go to sleep and a long hibernation. Oftentimes, the period from the 5th century on to the 12th century specifically is known as the dark ages. There is some activity in the 12th century, when the Pope suddenly realizes that he must build more political capital for himself and he institutes a series of activities called crusades, which is basically on the face of it attempts to recover the holy grail from the Muslim hands in Jerusalem, but it is different ways in which the popes try to consolidate their own political power across Europe. Can you, can you tell me, can somebody tell me something about the crusades? Has somebody read an old and probably out of fashion English writer called Sir Walter Scott? No? Have you heard of names like King Richard the Lionheart in England? Does it seem familiar? No. Have you heard of a name called Saladin? These are all names out of the times of the Crusades. You see, by the time of the Crusade, there is a division of the church, which is virtually an armed division of the church. They are knights. They used to be known as Knights Templars. These were people who had sort of dedicated themselves to celibacy, dedicated themselves to righteous living by the Christian standards and to fight martially for Christianity wherever such a fighting was needed. So, there were the knights in the errand of God as opposed to knights who were in the errand of kings. So, knights templars, they became the central focus around which the crusades began different parts, there were several crusades, first, second, third and fourth crusades over a period of 150, 180 years. As I said, the ostensible purpose of crusade was religious, to recover the relics from the sacred land which were thought to be property of Christians, because it was the home of Christ. It was also an attempt at a kind of a global militarism. Because the Arab world was immensely politically powerful. By the time the crusades came, the eastern empire 
which also used to be known as the Byzantine Empire, because it was based on Byzantium or Constantinople, was tottering. The Western Empire had already become non-Roman, but Christian. The Eastern Empire was tottering. And there was, you know, there is a lot of political, economic, opportunistic interplay in all these things. I shall just let you know a little event of this type. So, when the crusades being, were being organized, the Lombardian cities, that is the cities in northern Europe, which had been occupied by Lombards and which were, which were prospering, which were full of trade and activity. These Lombardian cities were looking to opportunity. And the Pope says, okay, now go fight the crusades. The Christian armies will embark and sail towards the Holy Land and fight there. Fantastic. People of Venice saw the opportunity for themselves here. Venice, of course, being one of the principal Lombardian cities and the great port city. So, they made a following presentation, they said, well, you know, if you really want to uh, send the holy army to Jerusalem and capture it, they have to land at some port like Haifa or Aqaba on the, uh, on the Middle Eastern mainland, on the Israeli mainland as it were. And that is a problem, because that whole area is controlled by Muslims. The best thing is to have a gateway to Jerusalem much closer to Jerusalem, the best thing is to com capture Constantinople and thereby you have the gateway to Jerusalem wide open and you could build a big war and so forth. Now, everybody knew that the Venetians were trying to make good business out of this, but nobody had a choice because most of the ships seems to be, seem to belong to Venetians and you needed the ships to transport all the ships and horses and cargo. I am sorry, the troops and horses and the Knights Templars. So, eventually, you know, there was an axe to grind across the place, that is what I was trying to say. It is much more, much more complex, full of little intrigues here and there, and therefore, a lot more complicated than a simple religious war. And if you read the stories of Walter Scott, you will find how in England, The coming of the crusades makes tremendous internal political transformations within England. So, lots of things are happening in Europe is what I am trying to say when the crusades come. Two things that happen with the crusades are tremendously important. One, growth of business, lot of prosperity. So, business groups are very prosperous because you know crusades they sell things to people who go to fight war for the holy purpose, but there is good business in that. Second, lot of internal political transformations occur across Europe, because it is a big political wave which is sweeping across Europe and lots of little, little waves happen following it, thereby changing political power structure with every crusade across different countries of Europe. But two other things happen which are not often mentioned. One is, there is an incredibly aggressive violence unleashed against all the Jews in Europe. Jews till the first crusade controlled virtually all business in Europe. The entire transaction of business from the east towards Europe was controlled and organized and regulated by the Jews for centuries. But with the coming of the crusades, one thing that happened was incredible unleashing of violence towards the Jews. They were massacred in large numbers and vast quantities of Jewish, Jewish property was annexed by the Christians. So, by the end of the second crusade, most of European business had gone from the hands of the Jews onto the hands of Christians. So, it is a big political economic shift. 
for which religion is an ostensible reason, but it is merely a predatory activity. We will take a little aside at this point, because time and time again religion has cropped up in the world involving vast passions, vast violence and more importantly enormous economic loss. And every time it has happened, there is always a little opportunism somewhere which uses religion as a proxy. What happened in the crusades is one thing that you see. In 1939, there was a man who fought against the world from Germany, whose entire ideology was that the Jews are the enemy of the world, we should destroy them. They are con controlling us, they are killing us, you should wipe them out and then do what? Take their wealth, take their resources. So, here it was done not in the name of Christianity, but in the name of national socialism. So, you see ideology once again comes in as a proxy for opportunism. So, where did the resources of the Jews go to? The resources of the Jews went to the existing Christian German business, the Krupps and the you name it, the Benzes and so on and so forth. I am not saying that there need be a value judgment in this matter, but I am saying certainly that the crusades is a clear illustration to us that there is a long history of opportunism, of political maneuvering and economic pragmatism, all of them underlying major ideological disputes. The crusades is one example, that is an aside. Equally important, this was one first phase of growth in European economy at the time of crusades, because not only is business happening because a war is being fought, but because precisely of that there is lot of going and coming in trade, especially the Lombard cities are making hay, they are really growing during this period 12th, 13th century they grew very fast. And therefore, the break happens along with the crusades out of the dark ages. Almost unwillingly, Europe breaks out of a long period of slumber into something positive, something aggressive, something economically purposive. Hmm? While this is happening, while the cities are growing, while trade is growing at this time, something else is on the eclipse. What is on the eclipse is the way in which rural society had got itself organized in Europe for the previous 7, 800 years. That is going through enormous stress there is a literal breakdown of that social order and there is a literal renewal of rural energies which starts around the time of crusades and completes itself around the 16th or 17th century. So, this period is a very crucial period not only for the rise of towns, but for a change in the rural social and economic and political order in Europe. But in order to understand this rural 
economic and political and social order which was transformed, we must go back in time again to the Romans. The roots of the political, economic and social system which came into existence in the dark ages in Europe lay also during the time of the Roman Empire. If you remember, I was telling you that the great involvement of the army in king making in, your, in the Roman Empire became tremendously expensive and the expenses came out of the taxpayer and the taxpayer was not sitting mainly in Rome, but he was sitting in the rural areas. So, by that time the rural, the face of rural Roman Empire had also changed. There was enormous wealth coming in, enormous prosperity coming in with victory after victory, conquest after conquest, empire growing and the money mostly went into the hands of the nobility in Rome and basically nobility of the empire. Formally, the, Europe, the Roman empire was politically organized in a kind of a democracy. There was representation for the common man in political power, but the affairs of the state were run by the senate which was almost totally controlled by the aristocracy. So, with these triumphs and victories and prosperity coming into Rome, it is the aristocracy that grew bigger and bigger and stronger. And when eventually the price had to be paid for king making for paying the army to fight other people's wars, it is the aristocracy which had to pay. So, in number of cases, landlords were trying to go away from their estates because it was becoming too expensive. You cannot maintain an estate paying so much for the armies and the government taxing you all the time. So, came the first of the regulations of that time. If you remember already, I told you that the prefects of towns were banned from leaving the town. Then the next, the landlords were prohibited from leaving their estates or more importantly, the workers, the farmers and the peasants who had become, you see what happened was the, with the growth of the power of the aristocrats, all small farm holdings were integrated and taken over by the aristocrats. And, and agriculture in those parts turned from small peasant agriculture to big estate agriculture, which was controlled by aristocrats. So, the peasants became the workers and these workers were banned from shifting from their location by these new regulations, because if there are no workers, there is no agriculture. If there is no agriculture, there is no revenue for the government. So, here comes a regulation very quietly which was to affect all of Europe in the, in the centuries to come, a regulation which bans the mobility, free mobility of rural labor force from one area to another, which means this labor force cannot anymore offer itself even for wages to anybody that it wanted to offer. It was tied to land. You are in this estate, you belong in this estate, this is where you stay. So, here comes a tradition which lasted centuries, a tradition where labor was locked up in the estate, could not offer itself, offer its labor power for sale anywhere in the market. This goes back as I said to the days of the political anarchy in Roman Empire. We will take a break at this point and then resume I guess uh, after the break. Now, you have any questions? We have a minute or so. No, you do not. Okay, we will take a break. <laughs> 